Hi, Neil Denari. I'm the Vice Chair um, of the Department. Um, in case you didn't know, I would like to let you also know that before we introduce Juan um, Wolf Pricks is lecturing next week. Um, so needless to say, get here early for that. Um, that's February 24th on Friday, not on Monday, just to mark that down on the calendars. Um, Juan Ix was born in 1974 in Belgium, and he founded Productura in 2006 with Abel Perez, Carlos Bedoya, and Victor Jaime. Uh, the office is based in Mexico City, um, develops it, its ideas through intuitive explorations and continuous production, production being the, the operative uh, word here, rather than adherence to an established strategy of development. And I'm sure that Juan will uh, explore that level of diversity. Maybe it comes out of uh, this built-in heterogeneity of the, of the team. Um, Productor, which is Spanish for producer or production company, uh, and indicates continuous production as a testing method. Monex has been teaching in different universities in Europe, Mexico, and the U.S. He's currently teaching an advanced topics studio here in the department titled A Hole in the Earth. Um, as a starting point, Productura architecture always tries to resume itself into one single gesture, one simple set of rules that can orchestrate a building. In contrast to many contemporary practices, these rules of operation are, direct, are not directly based on program research or other external references, but rather developed through formal spatial or tectonic investigations. This is through the architectural object itself. Um, one sort of thinks about uh, this team and the nature of production uh, as, as a group, rather than the idea of an architect as an author, and maybe it's almost a little bit like if you were a band, you'd be switching back and forth between bass and guitar, or if you're, say, somebody like Fishley and Weiss, photographers who sort of co-author photography. How many people can put their hands on the shutter at one time? It's a pretty interesting thought about the way in which things are made. Um, so please help me in uh, uh, welcoming Juan Ix. I would like to thank UCLA for giving me the, the, the opportunity to teach here during, during this winter quarter uh, to give this conference, especially to Hitoshi Ape and, and Sylvie Lavin, who I had the pleasure to, to meet at the reviews of Princeton last year. Um, a few notes before I start this lecture. Since so many things have been said about architecture, I'm afraid I will not say anything new. I will try to show the projects we've been working on. I hope you enjoy them and explain about our way of working in the office and how we create our projects. For those who are waiting to hear revolutionary theories or the postulation of yet another paradigm shift in architecture, I'm afraid I will disappoint you tonight. For those who don't know, Productora, as Neil said, is an office based in Mexico City and we consist of, of four partners. We've been working about six years together and we'll have a book coming out next month that, that uh, comprises like uh, more or less 30, a selection of 30 projects. The presentation is organized as follows. I will like, uh, present several projects which are loosely grouped in, in certain formal themes. I will go through them quite quickly. We might lose some in-depth information on these projects, but that's in order to, to be able to show quite some diversity of projects and, and keep, the, keep the time of the lecture uh, not uh, condensed. Uh, then I will make two short intervals in which I will read a short text while images will pass by on the background. I hope that this mixture between uh, improvised and read uh, presentation can create a, present, a pleasant lecture for you to listen to. That helps. Shall we dim the lights a little bit in the front? Uh, 
first project I would like to talk to you about is House of Arts and Culture in Beirut. This is a series of, of three or four, three projects, uh, which have a sort of a structural uh, theme. It talks about the government, the structural frame as a sort of uh, starting starting points. First one of this, is, the first one is House of Arts and Culture. It's uh, the plot of land. Actually, we have a sort of sorry, I lost it earlier. Sort of laser edit. Yeah, just okay. Yeah? Okay, great. Uh, as you can see, the plot is a fairly regular uh, uh, um, uh, surface next to a big inner city highway, and towards the upper part of the image, the, the inner city of, uh, of Beirut. Thank you so much. How did it work? For this uh, proposal, we try to work uh, with, a, with a thing we investigated, uh, sort of superposition of different layers of columns, sort of a Russian doll of colonnades that would uh, sit one uh, in, in, uh, in the next one. And by organizing uh, spaces in such a way, we could create, actually from this basic starting point, like adapting it to the program, to the necessity, and like joining these boxes much more closer to each other towards the inner city highway and opening them up towards the other side, we could create a sort of uh, uh, so spaces and uh, organization of terraces towards the inner city, while towards the main avenue we would have sort of a dense rhythm of columns which would almost close off the building from the highway created an acoustical buffer and almost could present itself as a sort of theater curtain. The House of Art and Culture is a theater place that has like basically two main theater halls, a uh, space for contemporary art, uh, movie, movie archive, etc. Uh, a model image where you can see again like the, the close uh, juxtaposition of the columns here and here a more open situation towards the, the city center. Yeah, the same in daylight, and he's, he can then imagine how during a, a whole day, like the movement of the sun will create a whole different pattern of shadows of these, uh, of these columns over these, uh, over these uh, volumes which are a step back behind them. This is then the frontal plaza uh, with access to the house of the main access to the house of arts and culture. So it's a sort of interesting theme because these columns, which of course work structurally in this, this day, they serve to to hold up this big roof, which gives a shadow and protection from the rain uh, on, on these terraces. At a certain moment, while they, while they work with uh, bearing forces here, they will work as, as pulling forces, like holding up this, this great uh, opening, this, this huge opening in the, in the wall. Then here you can see after the main plaza with access, like the different terraces related to different specific parts of the program. From the side, uh, you can see also that, uh, that, that it, it refers to this um, Middle East typology of the Mastaba, of the stepped pyramids. Uh, and, and, uh, here you see the, the terraces, no? one of the terraces uh, next to the area of the, of the theater halls. Uh, and we try to we use a sort of uh, diagonal patterns on floor and, uh, and uh, roof. And the roof is a sort of structural uh, way to connect uh, columns and like the different boxes which are standing one in, in, uh, into the other, while on the ground floor then these diagonal lines of tiles uh, with the shadow of the columns again creates a sort of, a sort of grid pattern. This of course, this, this, this lay with mosaics and geometry of course and has something to do with, with, uh, organi with the Middle East interest in this, in this tile work and geometry. How is that campus? The Roca is a, a very similar project, it's a completely different scale, it's a house in a sort of flat, uh, flat lands outside of Buenos Aires, uh, like about an hour drive away from, uh, from uh, the capital of Argentina. And basically the house is organized in a very simple way, you have sort of uh, main volume, uh, and towards the street side we organize a very small veranda, which is actually basically a sort of buffer, a sort of way to make the house create a certain distance towards the street and the access. Well, towards the garden, then we have a sort of uh, wide open terrace, a sort of uh, rhythm of columns that will uh, allow a view, a space, and a view towards the 
the, the open landscape. Here you see the house like a sort of more closed off volume from one side, while from the other side it's like a, it's like a programmed area extension of the house and almost a sort of interstitial space between the garden and the interior. And then the, the, uh, an image, sort of blurry photography of the of the of the look through the house, uh, which you can say this, this this game of vertical lines from columns to, to window frames. A uh, third project uh, that has to do with structure, uh, not again, not only with columns, but also with, with columns and, and, and with horizontals and verticals, is the headquarters of the Development Bank of Latin America. Uh, it's a competition we won together with, uh, with a friend who was an architect, Lucia Monien, uh, about three years ago, and that we managed to, to sign contract for last year. Uh, it was an international competition by invitation in which 44 teams out of uh, Latin America, Spain and Portugal were invited to, to develop 50,000 square meter on this, on this plot in uh, Chacao, which is a, 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 an area of, uh, of Caracas with a lot of uh, uh, like an, an important economical center in, uh, in Caracas with a lot of business. The site is really very interesting because you have like the main, one of the main avenues of the city going, uh, passing right next to it. You have the metro entrance here, and on the opposite side of the of the of the plot, this is our plot. You have like this existing historic Plaza Francia, which is like a sort of neoclassical uh, square with a with an obelisk in the middle. Um, yeah, there seemingly is something wrong with this computer. Uh, this images all turn out. Uh, so uh, to, we started to investigate a bit uh, of how, how should we uh, resolve this and basically one of our, our main uh, problems our main uh, problems we, we, we had to solve was the was, was to make to open us up as much as possible the public space since the 52,000 square meters they asked us with uh, uh, on, on this on this small plot, which is actually a sort of looks look actually as a sort of open square in the middle of the city, uh, in a lot of proposals or tryouts we did, it kind of filled up the whole the whole uh, uh, area. So what we finally proposed was a tower uh, with a very a very slender tower with a very small footprint, only 600 square meters of usable space uh, each floor, uh, which is. Uh, uh, almost a bit an inefficient tower, one would say. Uh, at least for offices, people would generally ask from, from 800 to, to, to more. Um, but we thought it was really important to only use uh, a very small percentage of the, of the open area of this, uh, of this square for the tower. This is an additional building which could also become, become the extension and to leave as much as possible the, the space open for public access for the citizens of, uh, of Caracas. Um, since the competitions, as they all do nowadays, asked us to think of a project which would be really sustainable and responsible towards, towards its environment and responsible in its use, we thought of how can we make uh, a building which is really, really, uh, uh, yeah, which is really thought of in a clever way. And we thought like that, the, that the, um, an economy of resources and of material and, and building system would be like the main, uh, like a basic starting point to, 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 to work with. So if we could use like the normal structure which is embedded in every skyscraper we see, uh, like sort of structure of beams and columns, if we could use these as, as well as a sort of um, powerful uh, architectonical image of our building. We could uh, we, we could shoot two birds in one shot. I don't know how we say it in English. <coughs> Translating literally from from Flemish. Uh, th then again, I, uh, we thought it was interesting to make sort of a monolithical volume. Uh, which would relate and, 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 and uh, have a sort of direct relationship with the uh, original obelisk on the Plaza Francia. And we would then have a sort of modern contemporary obelisk, sort of financial institution that would dialogue in a, in a certain way with the, with the classical, with this classical element. 
Um, we wanted to make the 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 base as open as possible, like the the first uh, six floors. Actually, I'll come back to that later. But apart from that, uh, the there's like a lot of low tech. Uh, issues that we try to incorporate in the tower uh, to make the building uh, less energy consuming. We thought it was really not smart to use like uh, very uh, high tech uh, uh, energy saving devices, uh, seeing that we are working in uh, Caracas, Venezuela, and we didn't want every time that something would uh, break or something would have to be fixed that we had to call a guy from Denmark or from Stockholm to over and fix, to fix uh, things in our building. So basically there's a cer certain uh, very simple technologies. For example, we wanted to try to use less the elevators. So we try to have open staircases in between every four, uh, four floors, uh, trying to motivate the use of, uh, of just normal uh, usage of, of, of stairs. Um, I will not go into details uh, of, in, in, of, of several other aspects. Until six levels, we can imagine in a building that until six levels there's a certain direct contact with the street and with what's happening on the, on the, in the public realm on the, on the street. You can still hear, you can still shout to somebody on the street. Uh, well, uh, from the sixth level on, it's a bit arbitrary, of course, at, at, uh, at uh, height, but your, your view creates a real relation with the uh, panorama. So what we did until the sixth level, we made a very open structure. In this structure, we have also the public and the semi-public functions of the of this uh, uh, development bank in relation with the, with the tree. Well, from the upper level, uh, from the seventh level on, we would cover and protect the building against uh, against the sun in a sort of a double in a double facade. Uh, it's a pity because essentially all the images, which are like normal uh, black and white, they seem to be like. Uh, reversed. Uh, anyway, uh, this double facade creates, gives the, the architect a lot of uh, uh, freedom in his design because you can just do a normal office uh, uh, office situation or you can make a terrace or you can make even build a drywall uh, and have archives behind it or just an open situation where you have machinery behind the double facade and it, uh, it would uh, have like the same, more or less the same uh, architectonical uh, language. Uh, this is what we gave in for the competition design. We didn't know exactly how it would be. We thought maybe it would be a sort of diagonal in each, in each square. Zooming out, it becomes this more and more white facade. We also made the highest building of Caracas. So makes a lot of powerful argument. And nighttime, of course, you would start to read the, the, the office spaces behind this double facade. That's another nighttime view. I think our hands slipped a little bit with the Photoshop uh, light, <laughs> light, uh, how we call it, light tools. So. Uh, and then again, uh, one of the one of the presentation models. Uh. Okay, the first intermezzo uh, about drawings. Uh, I will more or less read this. Since so many, I know this is architecture does not arise from out of nothing. Architectonical solutions are not embedded into the formulation of the design task. We cannot generate an architectonical idea based on just a combination of a program, a budget, and a site. No. The amount of parameters and variables is so infinitely big that, as we all know, the encounter of the client's requests or the competition brief with a specific site does not generate its own solution. Although Bjarke Ingels always tries to convince us over and over again in his wonderful presentations, that architecture is a sort of one, two, three step logical process from task to solution or from diagram to building. There is something else we have to add to make the magic work. Yeah. This element is ourself, the architect, the architect's interests, ambitions, obsessions. And this is not to be mistaken with creativity because creativity sounds too much like originality and originality is maybe what we have rather too much than too little nowadays. Therefore, what you see is images behind me is a series of drawings from a sketchbook of my partner Carlos that crystallize a whole series of spatial interests we developed during the work in our office. Some of them are closely related to projects, while others are just drawings of lines, squares, and circles, imaginative spaces, columns, walls, and volumes. 
This repertoire of interest is closely linked to buildings we have visited together, books we have seen, projects we have discussed, or artworks that are compelling to us. By talking about them, drawing them, and discussing them, we are creating, after the six years of working together, a sort of parallel universe that is continuously growing and expanding, and that at a certain moment, we hope, will become clearer and clearer to ourselves. A world of ideas that comes to the surface and appears through every project a bit more defined and outlined. Same ideas start to come up over and over again. Similar formal themes or tectonic solutions start to appear in different scales and projects. This parallel universe becomes an intimate, intimate world in which we are, in which we as architects can find depth and comfort. When our students might complain that all the generation architects, after a while, always start to repeat themselves, we see this variation of a certain theme rather as a positive evolution. We see the creating of specific interests and defining a limited number of tools as a project on itself, in which we as architects engage beyond the, the, beyond the individual projects. When Dan Flavin repeats his studies with neon lights, or Ellsworth Kelly paints more and more awkward colored shapes on his canvases, we do not believe that they are repeating themselves. They are rather obtaining a certain consistency, creating a body of work, getting closer and closer to the essence of what they are after, etc. But let, let's not rush it. Uh, I think for the moment we are having an uh, interesting time in our office to see uh, what's coming out. and. I mean, it's a pleasant search to which we are fully committed and which seems to only clarify itself through a very slow and repetitive sifting process. That's more or less well done. Uh, the LIMAC, Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, a project we did uh, very much in the beginning and it investigated a bit the different, two different kinds of uh, museum typologies or I would say like ways of placing art into space. On the left hand side you can uh, see like the 19th century museum, um, actually it's not a 19th century museum, it's, it's like a classical museum, it's actually an image, a painting of uh, one of the interior halls of the, of the Louvre, and on the right side one could talk about the museum of the 20th century, which might be typified by the open loft space or, or the, the gallery space, now, like a sort of infinite white space uh, where a roof carried by columns. Here you see again that this is Altus Museum by Schinkel uh, from, uh, in Berlin. And here you see more or less how these 19th century museums work. It's like a succession, sort of uh, collection of rooms. In one of the rooms, I mean, we've all been to these kind of museums. In one room, we have like the Flemish painters and the, the uh, German romanticists and the Italian, uh, etc. No? Like sort of uh, a grouping of, uh, of uh, paintings uh, in different rooms. The glyph obtained by Leo van Klensen seem to have disappeared from the presentation. <laughs> anyway, it's a building from the same year, 1830. Of course, uh, in, in, uh, with uh, modern architecture and with contemporary or modern art, one would say, uh, also the museum typology changed completely and the way, the, the, the way we place art uh, into the museum changed completely. This is the example of the Neue National Gallery from Mies, one of his latest and important projects from 1968, in which like uh, the gallery becomes a completely open space, in this case also open towards the uh, towards, uh, street, towards the city. Uh, there's hardly any walls, actually there are no walls uh, in, in that one. And that means that the sort of different, uh, the art will have to take the space uh, in a very different way. We were supposed to see this image, of Lina Valbardi, uh, Mass, the museum in uh, Sao Paulo, in where, where all of a sudden we can see that the, the, the art that conquered space, here even in its more most extreme variety, even painting, which would be always been uh, hung onto the walls, all of a sudden also conquered space, and, and uh, she designed this exhibition with like this uh, tempered glass plate standing in marble blocks to, to, to hang up all this space. I always wondered what the space would look like, seen from the other direction. There's no, no images in any archive uh, available. I know that they had uh, didactic uh, texts on the back, these, uh, these paintings. Uh, so it became sort of interesting investigation. Uh, we would like, we, we try to, to, to kind of uh, make a gradient in between like these two different uh, ways of presenting art or organizing museum. So we, we thought we could have a museum that one corner could like be sort of group of rooms 
rooms in which, which would have like a sort of really de clearly defined perimeter for the art, while towards the other side it could become like a sort of open gallery, loft space, you know, sort of space, uh, sort of open, continuous open space uh, uh, supported by, uh, by columns. Uh, this is then a sort of study model of, this, of the first uh, layout, in which you see like the central exhibition space, and then like all the auxiliary spaces uh, around it. Like for example, you have like this, uh, yeah, like a, where's the auditorium? Like an auditorium, like meeting, meeting rooms, offices, bookshop, offices, like uh, additional exhibition spaces, etc. Uh, this for us there was a quite a, a very interesting, compelling uh, 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 space uh, in which, like, all of a sudden you would have like open space which, which uh, would almost be 100 meter long, and on the other hand you would like have a sort of classical museum typology where you have like hallways connecting different like sort of collection of, of uh, defined defined rooms. Here, here you see it, you see it again, and about playing with openings of these boxes, we would like. Uh, rotate uh, and create like situations where two doors would encounter each other, like here, for example, or other situations where you would have like doors all in the same direction. Uh, these then, of course, were like structural columns uh, holding on the roof of the museum. Uh, all I've said until now has to do about the internal organization of a museum space. A museum, of course, also has an outside. This is again the Altus Museum by, by Schinkel in Berlin. Uh, museums that used to be very serious, you know, like a sort of a serious facade with like with columns that would be elevated. One would elevate itself going up of the, of the large staircases. One would elevate himself to the world of art, sort of. Uh, and nowadays, the, the the way a museum should look is is, is very much discussed, especially in, in the second half of the 20th century. For example, this is the Gary Museum in, in, in Bilbao, and also the museum should be uh, much more uh, uh, playful, much more uh, 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 calling the attention, uh, trying to attract this public. The, the problem is that uh, a lot of this museum architecture, like the whole shift of uh, attention towards museum architecture, has, uh, has shifted a bit the attention from the content of museum. To, to the form of a museum. That means that uh, a museum is a big success if the building is a success, or the museum is good if the, if, the, if the building looks good. So in this proposal for the Contemporary Art Museum in Lima, we try to, we try to kind of, to sort of vein at them, to, to let's say, let's focus again on the context, let's, let's make a building without any, any exterior facade. And we said, let's, let's excavate our building uh, into the ground. This example is a reference image of the, of the Lalibela churches in Ethiopia, which are like uh, art, Christian Orthodox churches uh, excavated out of, out of a massive, massive rock. In the same manner, we, would like, we, we, we thought it was interesting to excavate our museum instead of like uh, building it up, you know, like putting one stone on top of the other. Excavation is also the theme, the hole in the earth, the theme I'm working on with my students uh, here at, uh, at UCLA. Uh, that means that we had to find a way to get daylight into the into the space uh, again. Some some uh, some uh, experiments, which basically we had a sort of patios, sort of huge patios for access for the offices to have to have light. And then in these different rooms in the museum, we would like lift up the tip of the roof to like get uh, get daylight in these spaces. What was interesting for us is that at the end we could create a sort of abstract land uh, drawing in the in the Peruvian landscape. Um, which reminded us a bit uh, of this, of this uh, abstract uh, Nazca drawings, you know, these, these, uh, these, these drawings which are very mysterious and nobody ever, ever really understood why, why they are there. So we, we would like our museum to be an abstract composition in the landscape, just as, just as this. Hotel Tulum, uh, this, this is a series of projects that maybe have to do with the framing of space. It's, it's a small boutique hotel we're developing in the south of, uh, of Mexico, in the Caribbean, at the Caribbean Sea. As you can see, it's a, it's a rocky coast with, with very thin uh, palm trees. Uh, and we start to see what, what is interesting, what can we focus on, what, could we, what, what views could we frame when we, when we do such a hotel. So we said there are a view towards the sea, that's an obvious one, that's where everybody comes down for to, to to, to Lume. 
due to the nature, the nature is really incredible uh, at, at, at uh, Carina Sea. And then, of course, like a sort of Baragan situation, like the, the roof passio of Baragan, where you would create views towards the sky, you know, like sort of wall situation with views towards the sky. So we started to create a series of models in which we would combine different views and different organizations uh, and create this, this kind of small Donald jut like boxes uh, which would have like different different relations with the with the surrounding. Basically, we developed three topologies, uh, uh, which uh, would be like the different rooms uh, for this for this hotel, like sort of patio typology, like double height typology, and, uh, and sort of beachfront uh, typology. The interesting thing was that uh, this, this solved also a problem we had to tackle that uh, due to a very limited amount of square meters we could build on the site, uh, if we would divide these square meters between like, like basic functions we needed and then the 10 rooms, we would have very, very small rooms. Uh, and to give the, our guests a sort of uh, feeling of, of, of having more space than that we could actually offer them due to building restrictions. We gave them all like private patios where they could like take out the outdoor showers or, or jacuzzi or whatever. And here you see like the organization of these different of these different volumes on the plot. That like, becomes interesting because of the topography of the of the of the uh, terrain and also these um, platonic volumes that start to create like certain relations where they, in the back sometimes they're excavated into the ground and on the other side they could like uh, come out. The front volume which separates more or less the coastal highway from the inside of the plot uh, works a bit the same way. Uh, again, like all uh, big patios who, who do not count for uh, as built surface, so they, although you can clearly see they're part of a very, uh, really, very well defined volume, they do not, they do not, uh, they do not count and we can use them as, as really spaces part of our project since most of the time it's not raining there. Uh, the, the bungalows are rooms on construction. Uh, this is one of the beach front uh, bungalows. One of the double height where you can just look uh, over the tops of these of these small palm trees. Uh, and then like again like maybe the double height, you know, where you see like this. Uh, the material we use, the way we built in Mexico uh, the way we built that product is always very simple. This is done with local uh, builds it like just concrete frames with uh, brick filling and, and, and rendered uh, stuck of uh, thermal parking a lot. That again has to do about uh, about framing because Georgina is here with all the Argentinian projects. Um, uh, this is uh, Dolores. It's a, it's a city according to my point where there's really nothing to do. It's like somewhere halfway between Buenos Aires and the, and the coast. Uh, and they discovered uh, a few years ago that they had thermal water in the, in the underground. So they, they, they now did a national competition. We have a local partner in Argentina. A national competition to define a, a sort of a, a thermal park, basically space with a big lake, uh, spaces for swimming pools, changing rooms, spa special treatments, restaurants, hotels, etc. On this, on this plot. When working with such a vast horizontal landscape, there's always this question of how, how do we start this project? What, what, what is our reference? Uh, you start of kind of work as sort of like one. And just as, uh, as, the, as what happened with the colonization of, uh, of Latin America, of the Americas, I would say, because it's the same situation in the US, uh, this is actually a plan for Buenos Aires of 1822. We said, okay, let's, let's draw a, a clear grid on the plot. Uh, so we have something to hold on to. At least we have sort of outer perimeter, sort of center, sort of uh, places where roads, where like lines cross, and other places which are like fields. And we have and we have something to start off with. Sort of very simple way of attacking and colonizing the space. We would have an outside and an inside, etc. Uh, one of the things they asked us to do was to excavate 30,000 square meter uh, for a huge. Uh, lake in the, in the middle of the, of the plot uh, for canoeing, like to, to go around with boats. And we said, we said it could be, it, we, should, we, should do, we should do it in a, in a much more intelligent way. So we excavated a smaller area, 20,000 square meters, and the rest we excavated in a form of, in a form of uh, canals crossing the whole plot. So instead of like 
uh, floating around as an idiot with a boat in a small pond, you know, like in a circle. Always you could like use your use your canoe or your boat like to, to to cross and to go to the sports area or to to, to wherever area you you wanted to go. Uh, then again, what we did, uh, we all the excavated earth from the whole project. We like piled it up on on, on a small mountain, on a mountain, uh, able to, in, in trying to create a sort of uh, artificial mountain in, in the flat, continuous landscape of uh, Argentina. Here you can see the image of these canals going through uh, the, the grasslands and, and like having these encounters with your, with your boat, like going in between buildings, going to, to the different areas of the plot, and all of a sudden this, this, uh, this maybe a bit boring re uh, recreation activity can become sort of very interesting, uh, sort of very interesting exploration of the, of the site. Here you see the, like this artificial mountain, the sort of as a mountain that Noguchi made in this park in Japan, we kind of made it give the sort of artificial form, uh, emphasizing its its, its artificialness. Uh, and uh, yeah, like the main lake uh, in front of the, the sort of so the, the overall solution, like the artificial mountain, the water canals, then this, something interesting happens, but if you have to walk from to, to all the sides of the plot, you have to create a whole series of bridges, so the, the, these bridges they will become sort of fully standing in a landscape, creating like different accidents. Also the parking we tried to organize in the same uh, water grid, because we thought from the beginning, from the first moment you would arrive to the site, you, we would want the visitors to have a direct relation with the, uh, with the water. Uh, model images, as you see, the facades are, are, qu are quite simple and repetitive uh, colonnades. Uh, here again, we don't want to talk about the facade, the call center in Mexico City. Uh, basically, we, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple place, it's sort of uh, two main floors of a steel skeleton, uh, skeleton construction in which you have like a thousand people uh, typing on, on, on computers. And basically, the task was to develop a sort of interesting, an interesting facade for this for this building. Uh, one of the cheapest facades uh, you can find in Mexico is like these profiles, the metal sheets, uh, which are rolled. You know, they like profile to give a sort of uh, uh, rigidity, uh, uh, rigidez. I would say it's fine. Strength, you know, rigidity. That's it. Thank you. Uh, and basically, they're used for a lot of uh, industrial boxes. And we said, if we can use these, and we can like maybe switch, uh, interchange each of these panels with a sort of glass strip. And glass is also a cheap material. Maybe this could create a sort of uh, typical industrial box, but give it a sort of more, uh, sort of uh, more elegant, uh, elegant. Uh, so basically, we try to resolve in this one facade system all the all the solution, all the doors and uh, and uh, detail you had to do. We resolved them within the same system. You had like light coming into the central uh, to the central space through this this striped light patterns on the floor and these lines on the roof. And then it creates a sort of uh, industrial box which is transformed in sort of elegant in sort of elegant curtain. Uh, Rosario, that's where you're from, Georgina, I think. Uh, competition for a municipal library. Uh, basically, this is a plot. This is a plot. This is building a uh, very weird project by Alvaro Sisa uh, until until the Camargue uh, Museum, one of the one of the only the only the only building of Sisa in Latin America. This was a plot where they also developed a municipal library. Um, with all the library, of course, I asked us that again it would be sustainable and, and um, efficient in energy and etc. So we said, uh, how can we make a, uh, what, what's the most important part of the building? Maybe the reading condition to have good reading, natural daylight, uh, reading light. Uh, so we made a very small strip opening up towards the south, which in Argentina uh, is like the, the, the most, in the southern hemisphere, is like the most. Uh, Less uh, there with less uh, sun uh, hitting the facade. Um, so we said, yeah, we should make like a, uh, organizing the library in a very thin strip, so everybody would like be at least 
at three meters, four meters uh, away from a, from a window, in which you can uh, get direct sound or sound or light. Uh, we would add all the all the facilities in a in a strip like a toilet circulation, uh, but also like coffee systems, etc. In this the back side of this building to protect it uh, from the site. And then all the pieces of program that would not fit into this small strip, like for example, small gallery asks for a, quite a big auditorium, asks for a cafeteria, a coffee place, and a ludoteca, a children's library. We would add them as volumes uh, next to next to this uh, next to this small strip. It became very interesting because the building became like a very long volume towards a new part they're developing, and towards the I mean this is, this is turnaround like towards the building by of Alvaro Sisa, we would create a park which would be a sort of hinge between between our long library strip and and the existing the existing buildings. So these elements, although connected to the building, they would start to to work as a sort of Pavilions uh, standing into the into the park. It's then the facade towards the other side, like sort of repetitive uh, glass facade of three levels, which would be completely open towards the, the the towards the park. For us, it was interesting that while libraries they always used to be like sort of stone or or, uh, or brick fortresses that keep books well protected from uh, society, also the, the library would like be a sort of big open bookshelf. Uh, towards the street uh, and towards uh, towards the city, no sort of uh, very literal, very simple open invitation to to access the to access the library spaces. Models. That's again I'm going to read. We always work with physical models in our office. As you can see in the images behind me, these models are not precise presentation models or complex geometries generated by laser cutters or 3D printers. The models we make of any initial phase of a project are, just as the drawings you saw before, simple sketches, conveyors of a basic idea. The models we make are in general monochromatic, made of one material and rapidly glued together. More than a representation technique, they are a device to discuss things around the design table. They are three-dimensional, and we can look into them, cut them, turn them around, pull things off, and glue things on. In our fashion, it's the ideal tool to discuss things amongst us. In the beginning, we were very reluctant to work with the renders, basically because we didn't know how to use 3D programs, and we found it very annoying that these young students in our office would be so good in something we know very little about. <laughs> but we lost all our competition submissions. Until one day, we gave in our competition boards with simple renders with beautiful green trees and bright blue skies, and we won the competition. That's the CAF project you saw earlier. Since that moment, we always make renders for all our competition designs. But the render is a dangerous invention. We architects invented this powerful tool that we now hold as a gun against our head. While it was originally designed to give us a better understanding of our project before we start building them, it now turned against us and became a device that blocks any discussion on architectonical ideas and immediately leaps forward to a presentation of the visual result of the, of the proposed design. One where one can see materials, facade openings, landscapes, benches, etc. The render collapses the time needed in the design process to go from a schematic layout to detailing, detailing and materialization. Our clients will now ask us from the first design meeting to see renders, to know what it will look like, even before discussing what it will be. It makes any discussion on architectonical ideas impossible. Maybe the best example is the master plan for urban developments. While a master plan used to be a series of wooden or foam volumes on a situation model, by means of which the architects and urban planners will discuss urban morphology, the grain and texture, building heights, street sections, and the balance between open space and built volumes, now the use of rendered imagery converts it into a visual spectacle in which we see all the information that should not be seen and should not be discussed when developing a master plan. Our clients would now even say to us, look, I would like you to make a design for this or that. Well, anyway, we don't really need a design. We would just like to have a view from the river or a view from the entrance or a view from that or that side. A building is then not anymore understood as an artifact that works in this or that way but it's only judged on its good or bad looks. So this is why we try to postpone as much as possible the realization of virtual images 
to the sometimes great frustration of our clients and trying to push our clients to discuss architectonical ideas with us based on very abstract models and drawings. Um, it was a last intervention. The, 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 the project I'm going to show you now is a house in Misquack, a very a 100 square meter house in a middle class neighborhood in Mexico City. And I show this image of this image of the Scala Regia of Bernini in, uh, in uh, Rome, in the Vatican City. Uh, because this house uh, was basically a sort of play of, of with, with perspective, with false perspective. Uh, as you know, this project of the Scala Regia is like sort of a staircase connecting the, the form and the existing entrance of the Vatican uh, and, and there Bernini by uh, tapering the access by using uh, 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 right rhythm of columns would make this entrance look much higher and much deeper and much longer than it really is. The same thing happens here in this, in this house in the Chihuahua. It's quite a contrast. Uh, uh, this is the existing facade of the house. We kept it uh, as it is. For one part to, to I mean we painted it a little bit. Uh, on one hand, to enhance a bit the surprise effect upon entering, uh, upon entering the house, but also because of, at that time we just started our office, we didn't know yet how to fill out the building, building permit, so, so basically we kind of tried to hide the construction. <laughs> uh, upon entering the, in the house, you, you get this, this uh, view of actually it's very, uh, it's a sort of glass facade next to a glass uh, window frame next to the garden and sort of one bedroom volume which hangs over it and stands with like one edge on, on, uh, on, the, on the wall that uh, coincides with the neighbors. Uh, the plot is only 40 meters deep, the house is only uh, 96 meters big. Uh, and basically it's a sort of, a sort of play with it, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, optical effects, so basically this wall like move towards the towards the right. The grass also uh, runs up from zero to, to 120 uh, in the back, uh, and then the, the special window framing creates this sort of effect, uh, this sort of uh, optical effect. This is a staircase connecting the lower floor with the upper floor level. Huge detail. Again, this this would be the, this would then be the size of a door. Well, I think this would also be like one meter fifty or something. And then you see the like the volume standing standing across the on top of the garden, like giving a shaded area to the, to the garden. Fiscalia, uh, it's a beautiful word in Spanish. In English, I don't know how to translate. Public attorney office building. Uh, it's, a, it's a building that forms part of a master plan by Lopez Pelais in Madrid. Uh, it was a plan, I think it's now on hold due to the crisis in, 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 uh, in Spain, but to move all the justice uh, buildings out of the city center in Madrid and place it next to the airport. Only one is known now, I think it's a building by Sarah, by foreign office architects. So, jelly pudding foreign building. I think it's this one and this one. Uh, and this, uh, so several of the smaller buildings again open to international competition, and this is the one we participated in. Although in these these models you see uh, the proportions are really wrong, uh, we kind of um, found out in a very early stage of the project that we would need a whole continuous perimeter of uh, of offices uh, filling the whole the whole external skin of the of the building because that was the amount of offices we would need for the public authorities. And then on the inside we thought we could organize in sort of uh, very simple square volumes or rectangular volumes uh, all the additional uh, functions, such as for example uh, circulation, but also copy machines like coffee break corners, uh, meeting rooms, uh, etc. So while everybody would have this private office in the perimeter, already with correct dimensions, with views towards the outside, the, the internal spaces would be these, these auxiliary spaces. Uh, you would take create a sort of uh, uh, volume that looks that way, so sort of cut up uh, model. And you would see like all these offices on the outside and these interior spaces inside. Here you see how it works. You have like three 
vertical circulations, basically offices and toilets and not to be also put in, a, in the outer uh, perimeter. We could imagine that this organization of these spaces, I mean, uh, I think these rocks are like two meters away from each other. We could imagine that there would be volumes which would be almost touching almost touching each other. It's like when you go to New York and you look up and you see like this this uh, perspective of these these buildings, uh, which which relate to each other in a very in a very interesting way. For the materialization, we uh, we thought since they were so small, uh, they were like some of them were like only like a room big. These buildings, we could imagine to to make them very very slender aluminium and steel uh, steel uh, constructions, glass steel and aluminium, like this image from the movie Playtime by uh, by Jacques Tati. Uh, and I create a sort of uh, uh, space in, in, in this way. This is actually the movie where you see that Jack that did to film the movie, he made like a city, uh, a scale mold uh, city. So you see that's actually one floor height. And they are like stacked one on top of the other of Paris to, to make sort of uh, ironical version of, of the of the modern modern Paris. And that's a bit in the way that we would like these buildings to work, like a sort of family of facades, like a sort of Family of uh, of different uh, window framings in different um, with different proportions that would relate to each other, uh, as, as you see here. In this another image from the from the film set where the buildings are like waiting to be to be placed. So we kind of developed this interior uh, this interior courtyard with uh, with buildings, um, and uh, as you see, they all have like kind of similar. Uh, divisions, but by, by dividing it up uh, in one or two or three, you would create a sort of continuous family of buildings which would almost almost touch touch each other. You know? Like the guy, the person standing in this one, would would almost be able to have a have a, a conversation, would almost be able to touch, reaching out his hand to the, the other the other building. Um, a house in Mexico City, uh, adjoining a beautiful lake, a two-hour drive from Mexico City. It's a, a little town called Valle de Bravo. It's a house we finished like half a year ago. And when we did our first study models, a sort of a, a very obvious theme started to appear over and over again. It's like we would have, especially since, since the lake was just in front of our plot, that we would have like very long openings, gla glazed openings towards towards this uh, this area. It should not be studied five years ago. Think of something like that. But that's a bit the 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 idea. Not like looks so very simple boxes with completely a glass facades towards the side. Because the site has a slope, uh, we, we decided to stack uh, one one volume on top of, of the other one, trying to find a sort of uh, 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 good combination of like these these volumes and like the interstitial spaces, sort of dramatic space that would stay behind these these. Uh, these elements. Upper level is uh, guest rooms. I will go through it quickly. The middle level is like access, car, uh, garage, uh, main bedroom, and then the lower level is like all the main uh, living areas, covered terrace, and a uh, swimming pool. Uh, here you can see it uh, as a sort of aerial aerial view how this kind of zigzag house is uh, is like uh, is organized. As you see here again, like very simple materials, like a local flagstone, uh, white stucco, and some, some wooden uh, interior finishes. Uh, of course, we didn't have money to rent a helicopter to take pictures of the house, so we, we hung our photographer from a paraglider, and uh, as, a, as a first picture he took from, from a paraglider. Actually, that's the only, the only one with, without uh, him, he got sick, he got air sick. Uh, the rest of the pictures. Uh, that's a view from the street. As you see in a lot of our, our projects of our houses, I would say, uh, there's a sort of uh, uh, very, very uh, simple uh, uh, street facade, you know, this kind of blends in with the local town. That's, that's for a part for urbanistical reg regulations. They asked us to put uh, like sort of Techo de Paloma, they call it in Spanish, you know, like sort of wooden uh, traditional roof system and then like uh, tile tiled roof, um, small window openings like the, the, the natural stone wall. But on the other hand, I, I think it was also nice to give sort of houses sort of schizophrenic quality. You know, where you like would 
uh, seen from the street side, you would not expect anything uh, special. And when upon entering the house, that's a bit what happens actually also with the house, uh, Casa Baragan in Mexico City, which is actually quite a very simple and plain street facade. And upon entering the house, a sort of more complex uh, geometry uh, defines itself. Uh, you see, like for example, the stacking of these of these different poems. Uh, very simple hand hand drillings. Fisherman in front of the house, and then like the this this entrance next to the house that takes you immediately to the garden. Uh, next to this next to this trees three these three uh, volumes. From the ground floor, it will it will look like that. Cannot really see it in the from the from the garden level. I mean, it will look like that. You cannot really see it in the image, but also for example, the, the structural frames on the bottom level they're like four meters wide, and then by by going up, uh, we try to enhance the perspective and the depth. They get always always smaller. So it's like four meter, three meter, and two meter at the at the top level. And this here is like two meters difference, two forty. And here again, this this dramatic encounters of these different uh, these different uh, volumes. Which then create like all of uh, always like accessible terraces for the for the floor below uh, above the, uh, the covered terrace and then living space and again like the main bedroom with his with his own terrace on top of the on top of the living room and then the access uh, to the house has a sort of uh, there's a sort of, there's a staircase crossing the house like one straight staircase crossing the house uh, crossing the three different volumes. Uh, so it creates a sort of uh, strange geometries and angles uh, when these when these shifted volumes meet this this uh, this straight st staircase, which are then resolved or like maybe even accent uh, accentuated with this iron hand uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, it's a at a certain moment uh, in Lo the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. They asked us asked 15 or 17 architects to do a sort of intervention in specific places of the museum. To us, they proposed to do an intervention in this, in this the architectural landing, they call it, because that's the landing of the staircase uh, of uh, new use of, uh, for entering the architectural gal gallery. But so when they sent us the material, we immediately were compelled, rather than by this, by this, by this uh, space, by this enormous uh, marble staircase going up, going up the, the architectural landing. And we wanted to do an interesting uh, intervention there that would talk about uh, about how, how the staircase, which is an object uh, object to use, no, which is a sort of pragmatic object to bring you from one level to another, how we could turn it into an enchanted, like sort of uh, interesting spatial experience. Basically, what we try to do is to put two black angular elements uh, on top of this staircase and create a sort of dead ends. You can just walk through normal, but, but when you see it from below uh, or when you see it from above, you seemingly see, uh, create a sort of dead ends, creating a sort of, I would almost say, like sort of Alice in Wonderland situation, which you can see these steps going smaller and smaller and smaller, and like disappear in between these in, in between these two uh, black uh, black polished wall. You know? It was sort of an installation where we th where we think you we would create a sort of spatial experience uh, by by the people who would be on the move through the, through the object. You know, that's like the way the way looking down. And we were especially interested in this moment where you like when you were like walking up the staircase, you had to like turn around, uh, and, 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 and you would face the, the stair, face the stairs going going down again. You know, which, Uh, the house in Chihuahua, it's a, uh, it's a city in Mexico called uh, Chihuahua, in a state called Chihuahua. Um, uh, I will go through this very quickly because the project uh, some of you might have already seen. It's uh, uh, close, to this, close to this area of Chihuahua, there's a beautiful ruins of Pakime, sort of in, indigenous uh, ruins, uh, which are like basically uh, ex uh, like Ramped earth uh, indigenous uh, settlements, uh, half underground, half uh, half above ground, uh, and to, to they inspired us to counter the climatic uh, uh, differences in temperature. Like for example, in in, in, desert in Chihuahua, it can be 30 degrees outside in the daytime, while it can be freezing at, at at night, or the other way around, it can be 45 degrees at daytime and 10, 10 degrees at night. So. We, 
to try to bury the house, the house uh, partly partly under the ground to have it to give it as much contact as possible with the, with the Earth's mass to counter these these temperature balances. Uh, here, see again one of the one of the uh, images of the house in its uh, surrounding a sort of golf club uh, area in, in, in Mexico. Um, here again, the house uh, on uh, arriving to the house, it's a fairly simple uh, volume, uh, and then upon entering the house, a sort of more complex uh, geometry tries to uh, develop itself. It's basically a sort of topographic roof that uh, connects with the with the garden here. Uh, which then a sort of certain uh, patios are cut out, uh, like always like different relation, uh, like patios sunken into the ground, patios above, uh, patios to, to create sort of views to the landscape uh, and get light and uh, light and ventilation for the house. The roof then becomes a sort of interesting feature. You can you can access from all the different uh, patios and you can you can walk up to uh, to stroll around to. The here, for example, access to the to the living room in which then we combine different materials with different uh, different geometries. We rented this dog. <laughs> Celeste, Champagne, and Tear. I think we're almost getting to, to the end. Uh, I hope I don't go too quickly over the project, but I think that we still have some time for for, for questions. Celeste Champagne and Tea Room in Mexico City. It's a sort of they asked us to, to do a tea room on the top of this uh, uh, 19 that looks from the 40s, it's actually from the 1970s house in, in Colonia Ansures in Mexico City. Uh, these small projects, we also think there's not so much to do. We said, so we said, let's just design one very clever tile. I mean, they designed this tile out of, uh, out of uh, two colors. Which we we could then uh, uh, join together and create a sort of diagonal diagonal pattern. They're a bit dirty because I like to mock the, the dog, the office dog. <laughs> but uh, and then what could happen by turning and by rotating these tiles? They could these lines could connect again uh, uh, with each other. So if you turn around the tile on the on the top top right, you know, so they, they will start to come come back. And, and so with one single tile, we could create a, create a whole series of uh, of uh, Patterns uh, like sort of big, big uh, crosses, or even sort of all like a group of small, small squares. You know? If you then, these, if then these tiles could also go up on the walls or around the, the plinth of a bar, then a sort of very interesting geometry starts to appear in which, uh, in which these lines would like come from the wall, go over the floor, and turn back up to the wall, etc. Uh, we thought it would be interesting to make the whole bar like this quite a, this heavy uh, pattern of, of, of tiles until like about one meter high, the height of the bar. While the, at the visual at eye level, we would like keep it completely white. This actually even as we showed to the to the, to the client at the first meeting, it actually should be like really saturated uh, on, the, on the floor level because we will have chairs and tables and we will have all kind of. Uh, Things and, the, and then at the eye level it will be wide and calm, so there will be an interesting contrast. I think the client also never understood it. He was starting to hang up like animal heads uh, every, everywhere. No, but, but basically you can see how, how what, what's the idea, how it, how it works. All of a sudden this, this pattern create like lines and exceptions on, on different parts of the different parts of the floor. Unless some playful interventions. Actually, this, as you remember, the first image, this would used to be the only built area on the roof. So what we basically did, this, this uh, everything which was unbuilt, we made this uh, restaurant, bar restaurant there. And the only room which was covered, we took the roof off, we made a sort of smoking uh, area there, with a chimney, sort of outdoor, outdoor room. And I think that's the last project. That's the Villa Inorgos in, uh, in uh, Several people here. Uh, the client is uh, Mr. Kai Chan or Shai Yang. I mean, I never uh, knew how to pronounce his, his name. He's a sort of a Mongolian uh, uh, businessman, uh, entrepreneur, who at a certain moment asked uh, Herzog and Dameron to build 100 houses for him. 
I guess I can dump around uh, a second. Let's go do that instead of us. Maybe we can ask it to 100 talented young firms. Uh, so they asked their friend, artist, uh, architect, curator, Ai Weiwei, to, to help him out and to make sort of, uh, to curate this, uh, this event in which 100 architects would come together and would design uh, uh, an area of this new city of Ordos in, uh, in Mongolia. Actually, it's not part of this development, it's somewhere more to the few kilometers a few, a few kilometers north. Uh, this new city of Ordos, as it was presented to us, it's it's uh, it's not the most uh, uh, most interesting example of urban planning. It's like sort of very classicist urban planning with a central axis, all like the the public buildings here, like sort of theater hall, uh, library here, and then administrative buildings, and basically sort of from high high rise to middle rise to low rise uh, uh, on the outskirts. This is what they're building now, sort of, I don't know how to call it, sort of neo-French, Californian, uh, pastry design, you know. Uh, so it's, it's very shocking to see this appear in the middle, in the middle of, the, of, the, of the desert. Uh, so at a certain moment we were taken outside of the Holiday, uh, uh, Holiday Inn and, and driven to the sites by our client who was very eager to show us the different plots uh, we were selected to, to build them. So that's the architects on the climax, and it was actually not so much to see because every plot looks as his neighboring plot with uh, 30 centimeters of snow on it. And that's it's strange, that's a view like uh, half a uh, half year later, uh, when all of a sudden like this, the, the snow is gone and it's a completely different atmosphere, a completely different uh, landscape. Uh, it's a very harsh climate. I mean, in the winter it, it goes to minus 25 degrees, in the summer up to 40 degrees. Uh, in the spring they have sandstorms, and in the autumn they have mosquitoes. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, tough. Uh, we, we decided to make a closed volume, a sort of um, a building that would sort of house it would be uh, quite uh, introverted. So we said we we started off with a sort of, uh, basic square uh, volume, and we tried to open it open it up into in different uh, to different uh, guts. Would then would uh, receive windows to get uh, light uh, light into the, into the house. This is like the the view of the floor plans. This is like the underground plan where you would have sort of uh, uh, swimming pool, massage area, etc. The main uh, living area, which would be connected with these in between pieces, creating a sort of an interesting multi-directional space with views. To, to the outside, and then the sleeping levels would be like just uh, separated, uh, different separated strips. This is like underground level, a sort of strange uh, triangular swimming pool, uh, even with columns in it. So since, since there were no clients, we kind of made our sort of dream uh, James Torell piece in the, in, the, in the basement of this of this swimming pool. So it was sort of yeah, actually we had more columns in it. So it was a sort of triangular swimming pool with light coming in, uh, in only in the, in, the, in the bottom end, uh, the triangle at the end. That's the living room, uh, where you would have like a double height studio, like small, uh, small dining, big dining, small living room, big living room, I mean, uh, all the, the things they, they, asked us, they asked us to develop. And here you can see sort of this, this how the space develops in a sort of uh, very long and kind of Diagonal lines that, that goes through through the project. That's a space. Uh, that's in a sort of one of the model of the, of the space. Some first ideas of materialization. And then basically the sleeping rooms, which are like just independent volumes, which have their own terraces uh, on, on the, in the upper level. Uh, for us, it was really interesting to create a sort of uh, a, a sort of house that, from the outside, would uh, would look like sort of very robust volume, uh, in which then uh, light uh, could filter in in between these uh, in between these openings towards the building, or at night time, like light could light could uh, light could come out and, and and would reflect on its own interior facade. So here, you see it well in this in this, in this more image. Oh. Here's it. Huh? 
Here you see it as well, no? and then all of a sudden like windows are in front of this uh, in front of this brick wall and start to cast light. And there's a sort of continuous uh, 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 reflection of the house on it on itself. No? Sort of a reflection of it in intellectual from that sort of light casting on its uh, on its own uh, on facade. Uh, Simon, you tell me how what's going on with the project because I, I, you know, I have no idea. I will talk about that later. But once in the beginning, once in a while, we got these drawings back from China to ask if everything was okay. They would draw the technical drawings. Since everything was in Chinese, I mean, we could not really uh, correspond too much on it. Once in a while, we we, we wrote down a, a remark hoping that that they will build it if they ever build it according to to our. Uh, Okay, that's it. I think we, we have still some time for questions. Questions? Can you talk a little bit about uh, what Liga is about and what projects are you working on, and also how much of the influence by working with Fernando Romero in the museum that actually influenced the development of Productora? I'm really happy that you're research okay. or coming to this lecture. That's, uh, that's uh, very kind. Uh, Liga is a space we opened uh, about a year ago. Uh, in Mexico City, it's a very small space. It's maybe it's 15 square, 16 square meters uh, big. Uh, since in Mexico, there's a, uh, our, let's say in Latin America, there are no platforms for young architects to show their work, and, and mean uh, no written platforms or no no exhibition spaces. Like for example, for us, it was interesting at a certain moment when we were only working together for a year that we got this recognition by the Arch Young Architects League in New York. So you would ask to travel to New York and like to think about what you're doing as an office. Uh, in Latin America, there's like little, very little opportunity for, for, for that. So we opened a space, an exhibition space that, will, that showcases four projects of young Latin American architects uh, a year. Uh, it's a small space underneath our office space for openings. We have a roof terrace, which is part of our office, which we, we use basically. We do it in our in our own office, um, and it's a very interesting uh, space for itself. It uh, consumes too much too much time in, uh, from our office. But on the other hand, it gives us back a lot a lot of dialogue with our uh, Latin American colleagues uh, about the uh, problems we are all we are all seeing. But also, uh, yeah, a lot of encounters with with uh, different architects that uh, that have different visions, uh, and which basically, although it's their project, they're building up their installation in the space. Uh, we we do have a sort of very very close uh, relation with them. So apart from that, we also do like small lectures, which is sort of space uh, which try to create a platform of discussion for architecture in Mexico City. It's a very young project. It exists for a year now. We're now opening on Friday, as part of the no, in two weeks on Friday, uh, the expo exhibition of Carla Guachaba, uh, interesting Brazilian architect. Uh, yeah, let's hope. Uh, basically, we ask we ask critics. We, we ask them an exhibition in the space, uh, which through its its strange geometry and strange. Uh, Form is always a sort of site-specific installation because you cannot just hang plans on the wall and put pictures and a model on a circle on, on a base. I mean, because so it's always a sort of site-specific installation. We ask them because it's not a bigger problem in Latin America. We ask them, or we ask them that somebody should write a text on their work, uh, not a descriptive text, but uh, 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 an interesting text. Uh, been problematic until now. There's hardly people writing on architecture in Latin America. Uh, there is some people that it's like from a historical point of view. Uh, and so that that's that's a lot of effort for a lot of, for a lot of people. So, so then sometimes like by as I came as a colonial student, the second one then they would ask Charles Waldheim, they would like a lot of times like ask people from universities abroad to, to, to write these texts. Uh, we would love it if also these texts would be at a certain moment 
generated in, uh, in Latin America. We also pay for the text writing, which in, in Latin America is all, something almost, uh, they don't believe us when they say we pay for writing. It's like there we pay for writing. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and the third thing we ask them is to design a poster. Uh, that's these posters you can just take when you come uh, to, to our space. Uh, it's, it's been a success, uh, so that means that uh, a lot, there's a lot of attention. Uh, all our, all the, uh, a lot of, every time we have an opening, there's a lot of people coming. Actually, so many people coming that we cannot do it anymore in our office. So basically, what we do is we do a sort of private of opening on the roof terrace of our office, and then the next day uh, we always invite the architects to do a sort of public lecture in an unknown space in the city. So we like also scanning like unused auditoria incredibly beautiful buildings from modernity that are not used anymore and we try to take the architectural public to different uh, uh, places. Uh, okay, that's basically it. Fernando Romero, uh, uh, that's, a, that's an architect, I don't know if you know, it's the one who designed the museum for his father-in-law, uh, father like it's the much discussed Maya Museum in Mexico City. Uh, it's a, a, an architect I worked for the, when I came to Mexico. I worked uh, with him for a year, which was, for me was very interesting. I came uh, out of a Dutch office where everything was completely rationalized and structured and, and, uh, and uh, meditated, and, and, and etc. And working with him, it, it was a completely different atmosphere where I would like jump into this Mexican office where everything was completely visceral change idea every three minutes and, and, and every um, yeah well, that's, well, that, that, that's that's a, that's an important that's actually also where I met my partner Carlos and actually the three of uh, actually the four of us at a certain moment worked worked for uh, worked for Fernando Romero yeah. I don't know if you can draw any conclusions out of that that's, that's questions Talk a little more about this idea of the rendering of uh, 3D models, the enemy of talking about architectural ideas, I mean, specifically in an urban planning context and a master plan. Uh -huh. What do you no. really see as specifically the, the impacts on final design? No, I, don't, I don't think the render is a problem. I think that people ask for renders in the wrong moments. And that's, that's, that's why I say it's a gun we're holding against our own head now. Because now at the first design meeting with the client, the clients would ask us, what would it, what, how is it going to be? Can, can I not see an image? Can I not see a render? Can I not? And then you make a render, and then they would say, I don't like the face. I would, I would put another chair there. Or, you know, like, it completely distracts the attention to the wrong, to the wrong uh, things. So what we think, what is easier for us to do, is to work with uh, abstract drawings, can be plans of section, or models, which works very well in our office. It works very well with the clients as well, because they have a... Of course, there's a problem with plans because clients cannot read them. You know, that's sometimes a good, uh, good thing because you can sell them whatever you want. But that's sometimes also difficult if you if you if you really want them to have a sort of positive input in the in the in the design process. So we, we think models in our case is like the easiest solution. And I think what in the models you can make them understandable because you put the little people in it and you make them uh, you make them all the same color you make a monochromatic model so you have a sort of level of abstraction but at the same time you have a sort of understandable idea for them uh, and that's why now with the render for example we are like uh, experimenting how we could make renders which 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 do not compromise all the information and there's a lot of things I would not like to see in a render uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's a, that's a sort of, but but I really think it's a problem. For example, in urban planning, uh, it, it it is dramatic. Master plan is never anymore understood as a master plan because at the moment uh, somebody presents a, 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 a render of a master plan, and you see. Like all facades, you see a pretty girl, you know, like walking a dog, and you see like a supermarket, and you see like, and then they ask you, please do not mind all the architectonical information that has nothing to do with our plan. And it's, I mean, you cannot get it out of, it, out of your eye. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, uh, uh, every
every every detail in the image. I'm sure, and that's uh, that's what, what the, the uh, image analysis uh, tells us. It has a, it has an importance. No, you can, you cannot you cannot lay, later take it back. No, at the moment you show supermarkets, and you're not showing um, alternative art galleries. Both both are commercial spaces in the master plan. You know, like so it, it becomes it becomes very complex. I think. I think I think I used the master plan because I thought it was the most evident example uh, to explain where where it becomes really a, a, a difficult issue. I think a good example is also what I just read. You know, like the people they would ask you, I need a design. Actually, I don't need a design. I just need a view. And in Mexico, it happens a lot because they have to want to sell it to their promoters and say, let's see if this works. Let's check it out. Let's go to the government. And say, I need. I don't need to really a design. I just need a, a render from from that area. And then, and then we then I don't talk with my business partners. And it doesn't exist a render from that area. I mean, how can you make a render from that area? I mean, you can only do it if you if you really make bullshit. You know, you, and you say, okay, I don't care. I make bullshit in my office. And then later, when we get the project, we do something serious. You know? But you know, we all know that it's not. There's no way back. Once the, the client saw an image, you're you're. <laughs> you also know that this is, exists. I mean, you can, if you, um, like how many uh, master plans did you draw and then put an art gallery and an alternative space in? Yeah, you have my comments. No, yeah. that's why you have to draw. Yeah. Yeah. No, but the thing is, you don't have to draw in art. The point is that you lie to yourself if you do not or draw my comments or find a law which says in your master plan. No, no. So I think there is just too many bad master plans who try to operate on an abstract level, nice for a presentation, but then bad master plans. Okay, it doesn't make sense. So that's also reality, which is. I mean, that's beyond. That's beyond your your uh, reach when you do your master plan. We all agree on that. No, it can be McDonald's. It can be whatever. But but what I think is wrong, I think the tools to discuss the master plan, uh, in that sense, are wrong. I think I think we can we can easily, I mean, let's let's forget about the master plan. Let's work talk about because the master plan is a very complex issue, no? Because you don't have it under your control and all that. But with a, with a, a very simple architectural project for a house, no? Let's say that's a one on one relation, client architect, very simple, no, not too much complex political struggles and whatever, it's already problematic, I think, the render. And what we try to do in our office is to postpone it as much as possible. So we can really ask these guys, so so what what do you think what do you think would work? Could you like to make sort of open interior path, you know, do you think we should have large terraces? And if you if you draw that same thing, the open interior path you have in an in the render, they will not discuss anymore. If they want or not want in the patio, they will discuss the tree that goes in the patio. No. Uh, if you look well, not that much energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to stop them, and I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. pause, but, uh, uh -huh. No, no, never, never. Uh, these, these, uh, these are we call them. These are archive pictures, and it's the first time actually that we show them. That, that, that we try to put put them in a, in a lecture. Normally, it's the first time I do a lecture with like like two small. Interventions, one about the drawings and one about the one on the, on the models. Um, 
this this is products we have in the office. We we we, we as I said in, in, in the text, it is just tools we use to discuss uh, ideas on the design table. Uh, but normally the clients never see them. That means that we get through a sort of selection process, and at a certain moment we know, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is what we want to do, and this is the one we. Uh, we're going to work out a bit further, and that, that's the one the client will see. So these are all models from very initial, initial, uh, initial phases. So my, my question also really has to do with the question of results, like whether it's an abstraction and you know, reasonably can bracket things out, because the, the model, the white model like this, makes it look very much like a late 70s asymmetric mm. drawing. Yeah. And it, it Social life, or with uh, with, uh, with society, with with uh, with other forces outside of the force of the, uh, of the object. No, the, you're, you're the dirty realism. Uh, I mean, it doesn't. The, the argument of modern economy was that sooner or later, a, a, a radically transformed object would be inserted back into society, and it would do its work at that moment of reinsertion. And I'm These projects are not reinserted, they are framed. They are kind of stay autonomous as long as you I mean because all your facades and your sort of like argument about the facade as a to the urban structure is again a kind of framework which sort of like camouflage is what actually comes behind. behind. Um I think I think uh, in a lot of situations, uh, like a lot of projects we do, they don't have a sort of, they don't have a, when, when you do houses, you do houses especially like in the Gulf groups or in the north of Mexico, or I think like the, the, the relation to social context, the relation to, uh, can I say this without uh, making mistakes? Uh, I, I think it's a, very, it's a very autonomous project. It's a very, it's a very much a project that has to do with architecture and your private architecture and and, uh, and your and your relation. Uh, yeah, that's that's why in a certain moment when when you give introduction, you also there's a sort of architecture that is being explored from out of the architectural technical object itself. On the other hand, when then again uh, you have to work on a big scale, like for example the project in Caracas. Uh, there's like a lot of parallel stories that uh, I think that the form is, is uh, the way we work with form in this project is exactly the same, you know? so same interest and same spatial qualities and whatever. Uh, but they are related to a lot of forces that has to do with the public realm, with the organization of space, with uh, uh, the way you think a city should work. 
No? And then all of a sudden, this object, they don't become sort of innocent, autonomous uh, volumes. No? They have a very, very clear, uh, uh, I would almost say, like political and social agenda w uh, with them. No? Especially, I think that's also the reason why we won the CAF project. Because we were the only project uh, in, that, in that competition that did a strong effort to, to, to free uh, a big part of the square for, for public for public use. And now that's probably not the at all. You, you're the, you're, you, should, you, should, you should answer the question. <laughs> so, uh, the art, uh, architecture critic. Okay. I think we can. Uh, Wrap it up, that was really great and super provocative. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.